Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, we get thoughts from Mike Briggs on the cattle markets. Alan Vanolik discusses high land prices in Nebraska, Elaine Cub outlines some grain market possibilities in 2013, and Brad Lubin dissects how Senate and House versions of the Farm Bill would affect Nebraska producers. Mike Briggs is our market analyst this week. We talked with Mike on Wednesday afternoon about corn and DDG pricing and supply, consumer cost in beef, and if this is the end of a recent rally in the cattle market. It seems to. We did have a really nice rally. We got cattle all the way up to 198, which was pretty close to the spring high of 202. And I think people marketed cattle really well. And I think everybody, I don't know how much money those cattle made, but they, don't, they lost a lot less. So that was good. But that also forced beef into an all-time high. And I think that pretty much stopped the demand for now. That market rally, does that make people say, maybe I can get back in and start making some money? Maybe there's a gap for me here? It really hasn't as far as buying feeder cattle. I still have yet to see any feeder cattle with any black, anything close to black ink. Most of it's still triple digit losers, which amazes me for the amount of money that's been, amount, amount of equity that's been lost in the cattle feeding industry to still, still see people piling into those cattle, but they're Pack smarter than me. <laughs> Packers on the same side, they're not making any money either. No, they're really not, even with what they've done with the beef. You know, they tell you they're not making any money, but I don't know when you figure in all the ancillary stuff that they do, maybe they're they're obviously not getting killed too bad or they slow the chain down. Right, the last time we talked, I asked you about beef demand and if you were concerned about that, you know, another month in and there's really no relief in sight. Do you get more and more concerned about it or not? Do you still think it's a staple? So far it's a staple, but we haven't seen the price increases in the store that I think we'll see after the first year. You know, we haven't sold cattle at $1.30 yet or $1.35 yet, and I think we will. And then you're gonna see the six and seven and eight dollar hamburger possibly, and that might really hurt some people because then they may be forced to switch to other proteins. The other thing that we we have seen is we've seen export demand drop dramatically. Now, a lot of that has to do with the price of the dollar because we let our currency float, unlike other countries. But that, that goes in there too because at one point this year 20 percent of our production was going to export now as of the last report we're under 10 again that's a pretty big chunk that comes right back onto the market let's talk about feed costs uh, there's going to be a decision in a few weeks here a gap of a few weeks here about ethanol and whether they'll waive a mandate to that do you make any plans for that one way or the other do you just have an expectation that's a great question i don't know how you plan for that because you really have no idea what the government's going to do and I've heard both sides as to whether or not that's going to do any good. Right. I, th I think it will do us some good. It will give us some relief. The bigger things I'm more hopeful of is maybe greater production in the next production crop because we have seen extraordinary yields on the irrigated ground. Now, whether it's enough to offset some of the bad stuff to raise up the total crop, I don't know. Is it a concern for you in the DDG market, though, if ethanol slides? Oh, absolutely, because you're going to start. I don't care whether they get rid of the ethanol mandate or not. Ethanol is not profitable right now. At $8 corn, you need $100 barrel oil or that doesn't work. Well, you don't have $100 barrel oil. You're probably not gonna have $100 barrel oil for a while. So that means these ethanol plants, some of these ethanol plants that don't have deep pockets, they're gonna shut anyway. So then your supply of DDG gets a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. And it's already small enough that it's priced to a point where it doesn't really help us reduce ration costs anymore because you can't use it as an energy supplement. You can only use it as a protein supplement, so you're not using as much of it already. What do you see as the foreseeable future price for corn? 
Great question. I really don't think it's going to get eight dollar corn stifled a lot of demand and i think it stifles enough demand that i don't know that you have to get over eight dollar corn unless there's something else that comes in and shakes up this market having said that it ain't going under seven it just it's just i just don't think it can you're going to have to get clear into the next crop year and be able to look over the at least look over the fence and say yeah there's a crop there before this thing starts leaking because the corn supply that we have available is going to be so tight right into new crop I just don't think you can break this very hard at all. Dare I ask if you're bearish? <laughs> no, not on corn. <laughs> no, on cattle. No, I'm not bearish on cattle. I think cattle are gonna go up. Now, from a feeder standpoint, we have, we're margin players. We have to be able to carve out a margin and there's such a small supply of feeder cattle, the ability for a feeder to carve out a margin is gonna be really difficult. The other thing we do is we try to put pounds on cheaper than we're getting paid for them. And with $8 corn, it's pretty hard to put pounds on cheaper than your then you're getting getting it sold for so it makes it really difficult for feed yards to hack out a margin the rancher on the other side provided mother nature treats him a little better he's going to be in the driver's seat for sure next year but i think in the packing and the feeding industry we've got way too much overcapacity in both those industries and and that's going to come home to roost there's going to have to be something to dealt, deal with that it's a little bit like the fiscal cliff it's going to have to get dealt with next week we'll talk with jeff peterson on the morning of the release for the november usda crop report Kansas State's Art Barnaby told Ken Anderson of Brownfield Ag News that crop insurance payments across the country wouldn't be nearly as expensive as some have been estimating. Barnaby said higher than expected soybean yields and a price drop would keep underwriting losses under $15 billion, and they could actually be closer to $10 billion. Doan Agricultural Services reported earlier in the week that payments may well exceed $25 billion, which would be more than double the record of 10.8 set in 2011. You may have seen last week a record sale for farmland in Iowa. 80 acres in Sioux County sold for a price of $21,900 per acre. This is the same county that set the previous record of $20,000 per acre last year. Looking at Nebraska at the Crop Insurance Workshop in Grand Island Wednesday, we talked with Alan Benalik about the past, present, and future for land prices here in this state. Well, they're all-time historic high. Uh, even if you even if you inf in, in adjust uh, all the inflation out of the dollars, uh, we're probably $150 an acre higher than we were in 1980 at the previous peak uh, when you consider all class Nebraska land sales. Uh, and I would also add that land, the land has doubled in price, or just over doubled in price, right. about 120% of price in the last five to six years. And perhaps the next question, the answer is obvious, but why? Well, mostly because, well, several reasons. Right. Okay, the, 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 the land here deal is, is it's, it's just like any other market. It's, it's driven by supply and demand. Okay, so we have this unprecedented demand because we have increased profitability from farming over the last five or six years. And so what do farmers do? I'm not trying to pick on farmers, but what do farmers do? They put it into what they, what they need, and they want more land. And so they bid up the land. That's neither good or bad. That's just the way it is. It happened in 1970, 73 to 80. It's happening from 2006 to the current, to current time. And so you have uh, this investment being made in additional farm ground. Uh, and it's also a, a demand deal because you have a lack of alternative investments that are doing as well as uh, farm ground. Uh, the CDs aren't doing very good, right. uh, cap passbook savings, uh, stock market. Nobody feels very comfortable with those alter alternative form of investments. Uh, at least farm ground's giving you some return on investment. And then the other thing is the whole supply side. I mean, everybody's got to understand that Nebraska historically turned 3% of its land each year. So at any given time, you'd expect a piece of ground to come up for sale probably once every 33, 35 years, something like that. And now we're changing 1.26% of the land per year. Uh, like in my county, in Platte County, where I'm at, 0.66% of the land sold last year, 2011. So we're talking about a piece of, particular piece of ground coming up for sale once every 100 years or so. And so uh, you just don't have that, you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to buy land and so right. you don't want step, to step back and let that happen. And that pool of buyers comes pretty big. Are they buying cash or are they getting loans for it? The, the, the UNL statistics on that is 51% all cash. And, uh, and uh, it, a, lot of it, a lot of the sales that are going on that aren't completely all cash are undergirded with a lot of assets. And so uh, we're not exposed like we were in 19, the late 70s 
70s and early 80s. Uh, we've got a high leverage, high amount of leverage behind, a lot of equity behind these purchases. What are they seeing? What do they expect to be seeing in return on their investment once they make that? <clears throat> Traditionally, we would expect to return six to seven percent on land. But now we're down to 2 to 3%, which is not bad necessarily. It sounds bad, but it's not necessarily bad because land is relatively higher value. Uh, you're probably getting about the same return just on a percentage basis it's lower. And 2 to 3%, what does that compare to uh, passbook savings? 0.1%, less than one half of 1%. Uh, CDs, uh, 0 0.3, 0.4%. Uh, stock market, you know, I, I, I invested a dollar in the sp uh, stock market a couple of years ago in, in April, and in, in December it was worth 93 cents. That didn't work very good for me. Right, so, right. So, so the, the whole deal is uh, even a 2 or 3%, we're still cranking along. We're still doing something. The, the other argument would be a CD can't crash. You know, a CD is a set rate. The Wall, you know, Wall Street, when you invest in financial markets or land, it could go down. But that's not what's happening right now. Land values are actually still going up, yes? Yes, land values are still holding very strong. As you know, from the $21,000 sale in Iowa, and we've had a $11,000 sale, a $14,000 sale, and a $15,000 sale in Platte County the last two weeks. Once you get up to 21000 you can say 21 and some, and it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really make a doesn't difference. It doesn't sound like much, does it? So for that pool of buyers getting in, you know, if there's a farmer or rancher who sees a tract of land coming up, coming up you know, obviously there are going to be a lot of buyers and the price is probably going to go pretty high. So what are the things that they need to remember when they try to think about what their top dollar is going to be? Well, you got to work with your lender on that. Obviously, uh, as I talk to our lenders in Columbus, uh, they, they work with people all the time on to come in and say, okay, this track of land is coming up for sale. What can we do? And they, they try and figure it all out. And you got to keep yourself in a strong equity position. You can't get yourself uh, leveraged to the point that you're going to get in trouble if land values start to, to fall back a little bit. I just, it's just going to be a tough deal. You just have to decide what that's really worth to you. And, and, and kind of a little bit on the age and stage of your life. I mean, if you're younger, you may have a different threshold for the pain or a different, different threshold for the, <laughs> for the borrowing than you do when you're a little bit older. I mean, I, I personally, you know, at my age, I would not want to be into a 20 or 30 year land note right now to get that paid back. I'm not going to be working that hard that long. As we mentioned in a recent show, UNL Extension will be providing a workshop for landlords and tenants at 27 sites across Nebraska in November and December. The workshops are free and sponsored by the North Central Risk Management Agency and the Nebraska Soybean Board. You can find more information about the Landlord Tenant Cash Lease Workshops in the October 19th edition of Market Journal on our website. The November Nebraska Farmer says this may have been the state's worst year for wildfires. The Panhandle was hit especially hard, losing 150,000 acres of rangeland. Ranchers lost that land, stockpiled hay, fences and corrals. UNL Extension educator Scott Cotton says about 80% of families there are dependent on grazing and a little winter wheat, so the fires will have a huge extended impact. You can read more about this in the November Nebraska Farmer. Elaine Cub spoke in Grand Island about scenarios for the grain markets in 2013. As South America has dominated and probably will control the news cycle for soybeans over the next few months, corn is arguably quieter. We asked Elaine about volatility in those markets next year and about speculators in the energy sector. But after hearing Elaine's presentation, I asked if she was a bit more bearish going forward than most analysts seem to be. Well, I'm not bearish in the sense that I'm looking for prices to go down. I think we have established a floor below which farmers have locked their bin doors and they're not going to bring the grain to market. But to the degree that a lot of people are calling for new highs, no, I don't think that there's a justification for new highs yet because we have demonstrated that we destroy demand that our customers and our customers' customers cannot afford to pay $8 or $8.50 for corn, for instance. So what would have to happen for us to make new highs is something's very strange with the dollar or a huge global recovery where our customers could pay that but until either of those things happen you know I'm not looking for new highs I'm very neutral one of the scenarios you said in, in corn especially you look at the three markets for corn in exports in ethanol and then in the livestock industry livestock industry has cut numbers ethanol industry is struggling and the export market is sort of non-existent right now is there any growth in any of those that you could see where it kinda takes some of that percentage that is a pretty good question. I mean, the ethanol industry certainly is in a position where it could start to make profits if, if energy comes up. And the same thing can be said for the export market, too, is you're just looking for a global recovery where the customer can pay more. That's the only way that we can really make these prices make sense. Soybean-wise, let's talk about Brazil. Let's talk about South America. Yeah. If Brazil would happen to come through with a large number of acres like we're expecting them to do, how volatile could that make soybean prices? Are we seeing a huge shift one way or the other here? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we're in a situation where the, the 2013 soybean prices have sort of been on a sideways path right now, but we will know within the next couple of months whether or not that crop has gotten a decent start or even an, an adequate or satisfactory start moisture-wise. And if that happens, yeah, I, I don't think that that market is going to stay sideways. It's going to go up or down, very closely dependent on what South America's weather behaves like. Has China positioned itself well? They're already well ahead on their exporting year, or their importing year, rather, yes. of soybeans. So does that make a difference? Yes, they have inventories built up. They are being very smart about that. So they are in a position where they don't have to pay anything more than what they do. If you look at the, the soybean prices at their futures exchange right now, mm -hmm. it does make sense. I mean, the arbitrage makes sense. They're like $20 per bushel in U.S. dollar equivalents. But at this point, yeah, like you said, they're not, they don't need the new supplies yet. What's your, uh, what's your guess for acres next year as you look into 2013? because people are going to start to think about buying seed now before we mm -hmm. get to the end of year most likely. Informa says 97 and a half for corn, 80 for beans. That's a lot of acres. Is there any way that that proves true? There is a lot of acres and something that we saw last year that can happen again this fall is that we've got this nice dry fall and lots of time for people to right. work land, put new land into production. So it's certainly possible for us to be expanding our acre base for the row crop specifically and to perhaps lose some out of the cotton acres or peanut acres, things like that. Right. If that does happen, we mentioned before demand destruction. What happens if the U.S. does in fact plant that many acres of corn and soybeans? Is there a problem with how much production they're going to have? Well, there's a pro there might be a problem in storing all of it. We've built a lot of storage in the past few years because our yields have been going up, but we will certainly test the abilities of us to store 30 percent stocks to use ratio of corn. We're going to have a huge crop if we have normal weather and these projections for acreage and yield. Could see a lower price, though, essentially. Absolutely. Yeah. Dramatically lower. <laughs> Let's talk about energy prices. You were mentioning before that the speculators have a, a way to affect it here. Go on on that. Yeah, so between now and the end of the year, if you are a fund manager, you are going to need to be rebalancing your fund to make sure that you've got the correct weights of all the various commodities that you're into. And in, to the sense that you probably made a lot of money on your long soybean positions year, this year, now you're in a position where you're going to want to be selling those net long soybean positions that the funds are still holding. They might need to get rid of those in the next couple of months. And we certainly saw their willingness to get rid of them on, any, on a day when anybody's antsy about getting into cash, like the day when the stock market was closed because of the hur hurricane. Right. So anything like that can certainly scare these funds, these speculative investors, out of these markets. Which drags everything down then? Well, it dra drags it down on certainly a day-to-day -day basis in the futures price, but like we've mentioned, the farmers are not going to sell if the prices go down, so that means that the basis might certainly strengthen to sort of even out the cash price offered to farmers. The volatility in 2013, do you expect it to be as ranging as it was in 2012? It's obviously a question that depends a lot on weather in South weather. America. Yes, exactly. But going going into 2013 for these old crop prices, I, I mean, again, I think nothing might change for what we know about the supply we have and the fact that customers are not be able to pay very much. So we might have a pretty tame couple of months for old crop prices. We'll see next week if the November crop report has anything to say about tame prices. A recent windstorm knocked over unharvested corn in central Nebraska, leaving as much as 100 bushels an acre on the ground in places. Some growers are raking and picking the corn up with a bean head or simply raking and baling the rows. UNL Extension beef specialist Rick Rasby says this down corn can also be grazed by livestock with careful management. It's almost like having a, a feedlot out there with unlimited access to corn, and so you really have to be uh, be careful. The class of livestock that you might think about uh, grazing these kinds of stock fields would be weaned calves and yearlings probably would be the first option. Uh, the reason is is that you have a, a lot of energy out there, and you want to be able to at least uh, have cattle gain on that. Mm -hmm. You know, Maintaining a gestating beef cow probably isn't the way to use that. Rasby says producers could think about strip grazing or overstocking the field to limit cattle intake. You can find more information about harvesting down corn on the CropWatch website. As Congress was unable to pass a new farm bill before leaving Washington for the general election, farmers and ranchers now wait. They wait for a lame duck Congress to move in some capacity on new legislation. House Majority Leader Eric Cantor from Virginia has said he's committed to bringing the issue to the floor after the election. There are differences in the Senate and the House versions of the bill, though, and those differences could impact Nebraska producers. We talked with Brad Lubin about that Wednesday and asked if something would get done by January. It's safe to say something will happen. Uh, Post-election, Congress does come back in lame duck session. Congress, given where we stand right now with the Farm Bill debate, they clearly will do something because they have to avoid permanent legislation coming into effect in January. Uh, we can't manage 
permanent legislation that dates to 1949. So we're either stuck with, can we wrap this up in two months uh, and get a new farm bill through? Or do we find a way to get a short-term extension through that pushes off the debate to the new Congress? Let me just ask you a blunt question before we get into specifics. Are there major differences, as you look at Nebraska and Nebraska producers, are there major differences between House version and Senate version? Well, there are two fundamental differences between the House version and Senate version. Uh, both of them propose a revenue-based safety net. But, number one, the House also proposes a, uh, a price-based safety net as an alternative. For our Midwestern commodities in Nebraska, it just doesn't appear that that price safety net matters given current price levels that we see for corn, soybeans, sorghum, wheat. Uh, if you're in the South, you worry a little bit more about price if you're a cotton or, or rice or peanut producer, but not here. And we're just at price levels where those do look irrelevant. So the, the revenue-based safety net looks like the critical part. And between the House and the Senate, the differences are relatively minor. Uh, the other big difference between the House and the Senate bill is relative to nutrition and that right. amount of spending, and that's just a problem that they've got to solve. And which will be going to get the bill done. That's yeah, right. Which will be fun. Crop insurance differences in either? Crop insurance uh, between the two are, are relatively consistent. Uh, there is a new program proposed called Supplemental Coverage Option, or SCO. Think of it as a area-based crop insurance plan that you could choose to cover part of your deductible that you don't cover with your individual plan. If you choose the commodity program and you have, an, you have a revenue-based safety net uh, that, that helps cover some of that loss, but there's still a gap between where that safety net kicks in and kicks out and where crop insurance kicks in on your farm, that gap might be coverable with a, with a supplemental plan here. Ultimately, as you said before on the show, that what producers want is a protection for crop insurance. Right. Is it to the, to the extent that they want on either version? I, you know, frankly, crop insurance uh, has been essentially protected, not touched in large measure in this farm bill debate to date. They're adding provisions with supplemental coverage, they're adding a few other provisions, but the fundamental components of crop insurance are in place. And producers basically started this farm bill debate by saying crop insurance works, don't mess it up. And Congress has not uh, rewritten it to date there's a chance that, that we have to revisit that, that discussion as we go because commodity programs and supplemental coverage and individual crop insurance are starting to intermesh with each other in a much more you know, integrated framework. But at the moment, crop insurance is the foundation and it looks like it will stay so. Again, you see something happening, something happening before <laughs> January 1st because if it doesn't, we kind of will have to meet again because Correct. we'll have a whole new thing. Correct. Uh, something will happen. That we have the we have the the heavy hammer of permanent legislation, which really isn't feasible, politically, economically, even technically. We have the heavy hammer that says you have to do something to forestall that before January first. The the short run solution is a whole new bill that finishes what both the House and the Senate have started. That helps to provide some savings. It helps to pay for the other major questions in December. Uh, tax policy and, and budget policy. The, the longer run scenario is we still can't get it done, but we can pass an extension that pushes off the permanent legislation from taking effect, gives a new Congress time to act. Now to forecast the coming week, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here again for the weekly forecast. Before we get to the main forecast, let's kind of take a retrospective look over this past week. For here in Nebraska, really the only thing we dealt with was a few waves that were moving on the backside of the upper area trough that was supportive of Hurricane Sandy coming into the northeastern United States. And they did drop a few sprinkles in portions of north central northeast Nebraska, but no significant accumulations. I couldn't find any place that received more than a tenth of an inch of liquid equivalent moisture. However, when you went to the eastern seaboard, as this hurricane came on board into the northeast, there was a considerable amount of areas that received well in excess of three inches and up to six, seven inches in some isolated areas. And of course, we had all the blizzard conditions in the mountain areas of Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, and portions of Pennsylvania. Now we're into the process of cleaning up as, is, as the trough itself has left the northeast and we are looking at the west in terms of our weather as we progress through this next week to a 10 day period. And there are signs that an impending storm may be moving into the western United States as we go into the middle of next week. But for us, 
Doesn't look like much in the way of any moisture on tap for us over this next seven day period. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we could expect as we go through this next seven days. And I'll draw your attention to there's another piece of energy trying to ride uh, southeastward from uh, south central Canada. May again drop a couple light shower at, uh, showers across northeastern Nebraska and maybe even east central Nebraska as the system moves toward the north or toward the southeast. And we'll start to dig a fairly decent trough. And that will keep us in the cooler weather here in the eastern part of the state for the weekend with much warmer conditions out west. We could be looking at a 10 to 15 degree differential from northeast to southwest. Now as we go in to the day on Sunday, we'll see another piece of energy that's going to pivot down through here. And again, once again, we'll have a chance for some uh, isolated showers, but it looks like the main accumulating moisture will be east of Nebraska. And then as we go into the day on Monday, we'll see that that energy drops down to the south of us and we're starting to dig a fairly decent trough and that's going to keep it once again keep the cool weather in place but as the system moves toward the northeast that's going to allow the ridge from the western united states to build into the region and we'll have much warmer air on tap as we start to see the ridge building into our region on tuesday we should expect to see that continue all the way into wednesday and we'll be firmly planted under this ridge and it looks like everybody's going to have a fairly decent day as we get in the middle of next week we'll be looking consistently at 60s and 70s across the state and as we go into thursday we're going to start to see some of that warmer air slide into slide east eastward and that trough starts to make its approach into the western United States and this is something we'll have to pay attention to as we get into next weekend because on Friday we now we start to see the trough making itself materialize into the portions of the western United States and we'll see that rapidly ejecting out into the plains as we go into next weekend and we do have the potential for a very significant storm somewhere in the central to northern plains we'll just have to keep an eye on things but it does offer potential for some very significant moisture. Now, as we go into the 8 to 14 day forecast, they are showing above normal temperatures in front of this trough, but there's some significant cooling behind this trough. But in terms of precipitation, I think that we'll see that above normal precipitation spread much farther to the south. So it does look like a positive trend for next week, and let's just hope that it does hold together. Thanks, Al. For more information from Market Journal or to see archived episodes, you can visit our website at marketjournal.unl.edu. Next week, Jeff Peterson will be with us to look at the November crop report and we'll look at rebuilding windbreaks after drought. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.